Growing up can be tough. As we move through puberty, we start to discover new things about ourselves. More and more teenagers are turning to the online world for answers and advice about sexuality. Often they will find a group of people creating videos on YouTube. Those people are YouTubers. They're providing a generation with the role models and mentors that they just don't get in mainstream media. Some make sex education videos, some vlog as a couple, and some just give advice. As they become more and more successful, are they just using their sexuality to get views, to become rich or even become famous? Speaking to creators within the community, we'll see how sexuality is embraced and exploited in an ever-growing platform. To find out, is it for the fame or for the fans? I'm Rowan. I'm a presenter, YouTuber and a queer woman myself. I make videos online about gender, sexuality, pop culture and activism. Being someone who both watches and makes videos, I understand the behind the scenes element, the analytics, the idea that a particular title or thumbnail could get you more views. So I'm going to take a break from being in front of the camera to go behind the scenes to talk to some of these YouTubers offline. And what better place to start than here, in the bustling heart of the UK YouTube community, the YouTube space London. The first people that I want to go and talk to are Shosh and Matt. They're a same-sex couple and by the looks of their wedding video, they've just gotten married. They're a relatively small channel with around 5,000 subscribers. It's not something that they do full time. So I want to talk to them about why they started their YouTube channel and how including their sexuality in their videos has had an impact. So let's go meet them. Uh, so how did you two meet? Um, so we met online, uh, it was 2011, and I started, uh, I, I made an OkCupid okay profile, and I came across Shoshana's profile, and I sent her a message, and I said something along the lines of, hi, I'm willing to bet we'd get along, and I didn't ever hear back from her, until we actually met in, in real life. Um, Shoshana was meeting up with a friend of mine, and um, we all went out to a bar one night, and I realized that the girl who I'd messaged and who had never gotten back to me was indeed Shoshana. That's how true romance starts, I guess. <laughs> so you had to become a long distance couple at some point, right? For a while. Yeah, so. after like a year of dating mm -hmm. in New York, um, then my visa ran out and I couldn't renew it. So I had to come back. Um, and then we were long distance for a few months, which was really hard. Knowing a bit more about them and their relationship, I'm interested to see how this made an impact when starting their YouTube channel. So did you watch any YouTubers before you started making videos yourself? Um, yeah, so we watched a couple of um, channels that, were, that had been long distance um, that would film their trips together and then like, focus on the positive um, aspects of the relationship rather than just dwelling in sadness of missing each other. And so was that kind of after you watched them, you kind of became inspired and decided to do that yourselves? Yeah, um, so I said to Meredith, like, next time I visited her, oh, like, I found this thing. Should we give it a go? Yeah. This is Meredith. Please. Also known as Death. Going through your videos, you have a lesbian couple in a lot of the titles. Um, what's the reason behind that? Yeah, I think um, we've come to know who our audience is. And so I think by just making it as clear as possible, this is a video about a lesbian couple. I think it just makes it easier to find, really. Did you have anything like this when you were younger? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I really felt um, like I was a strange person for being this way. Um, but I think if I had seen that there were other people like me, um, then I think I'd have been so much more comfortable in my own skin. Um, so I guess we're kind of making content that we both wish we had. I'm happy to see that, that, that it that the LGBT community has found a place. And I do think that YouTube happens to, to be really helpful um, in sort of like making people feel less alone. 
you might not be able to be who you really are and like offline but when you're in front of that computer you know that you're not alone talking to Shoshana and Meredith I think it's clear that they're a bridge between two worlds They've been both fans and creators. They've given us a perspective on why people want to watch content about sexuality and why creators decide to include their sexuality in their content. I think who we need to talk to now is somebody who uses YouTube for their income as part of their career. I'm on my way to meet Callum McSwiggum. I've met Callum at a few events and his content seems a lot more about sexuality than, say, Shosh and Merz. His vibrant thumbnails and powerful titles can be seen by people outside the community as clickbait. What I want to know is, how much of an issue is clickbait when involving sexuality in your content? Was it a deliberate intention when you started to have this focus on LGBT stuff, or was it sort of just um, an, an inherent part of the kind of content you'd create? I was always really, really passionate about LGBT plus issues, but I was also very conscious that I didn't kind of want to define myself as a gay YouTuber. So I fought against that for a little while. I tried to make comedy videos and things like that. And I don't know why I so kind of vehemently fought against that, but I did. And then whenever I made content that was LGBT plus, people just responded to it so well. So I was like, I'm going to lean into this. And then I kind of made my channel all about that. And I'm really happy that I did. YouTube's such a new platform comparatively. Do you think that anyone thought that they would become role models at the beginning? Um, and is that something people have kind of grown into or something that people are pushing against a bit? I don't think they had any idea that it would turn into this enormous thing. I don't think they had any idea that they would have millions of subscribers in the future. But then as YouTube progressed, I think people are starting to go into it now going, you know, I can make something of myself. I can share my voice to a lot of people using this platform. So I think people are a lot more aware of the possibilities out there now. Like I certainly was when I started. I, you know, I didn't expect to grow a huge audience, but I did think, you know, this is a possibility. Having learnt why Callum includes his sexuality in his content, I want to know from his point of view how this can sometimes be exploited. So what's the thought process behind a thumbnail? I've always, I've always said that the thumbnail is like, if you had a product and you were selling it in a shop, um, you would want people to buy that product. So you try and make the package as appealing as possible. So sometimes in terms of getting people to click onto the video. Sometimes I think the thumbnail is even more important than the actual content itself. So I always try and kind of make it tr both true to the video and also something really appealing. So, I mean, if you're making LGBT content, for example, does it make sense to have rainbows over it or is there any, anything that you tend to put in that's a key visual? If I'm making something like, if I was doing a video about coming out or something like that, then I would definitely, absolutely, put a rainbow flag into it because I think it draws the eye quickly and it makes people aware that this is, you know, a video about something LGBT+. So I think that's really, really important. How do you decide how to title your videos? I mean, the most important thing is thinking of a title that jumps out and catches their attention while being truthful to what the actual content is, I guess, which can be really difficult sometimes. Like, um, I'm looking now and there was a video four months ago um, where I talked about bisexuality and I was talking about the fact that some people say that bisexuality doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I decided to title the video Bisexuality Doesn't Exist, but that was definitely going into the realm of clickbait. And I got a lot of people coming to that video who didn't even watch the video calling me out, calling me homophobic for saying that bisexuality doesn't exist, which I wasn't saying. I was saying the opposite. So something as simple and something as seemingly insignificant as a title can have an enormous impact. So you've only just recently um, uploaded a coming out video, which is sort of like a staple for LGBT mm -hmm. YouTubers. Most yeah. of them have done it. Um, why did you wait so long to make that video? For me, my coming out experience was really, really easy. I didn't, there was no drama. I came out, I was completely accepted. And that was all that happened really. And I think I had seen so many coming out stories where people were kind of talking about it and you know they'd had a really really difficult experience and in a way I felt like I almost didn't have a right to share my story and then I thought you know what some people need to know that when you come out that it's going to be absolutely okay and there's going to be no problem so I decided recently to share my coming out story plus like when you put my name into YouTube, like coming out was the biggest thing people were searching for. So I was like, people want to hear this story. So I'm going to share it, even if it wasn't dramatic or anything like that. 
there have been some YouTubers who have been criticised in some areas for the timing of their coming out videos mm. or how they've used it. Do you think that there's a danger of it being exploited in any way? Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if this is true at all, but I have heard rumours before of certain YouTubers, you know, waiting till they hit a certain amount of subscribers before they do their coming out video because they're trying to, you know, capitalise on it. And they, they, you know, all YouTubers who make a coming out video, their channel does t tend to get a like a little spike. It does tend to have this kind of overnight growth when they do it. So I don't think they're necessarily trying to exploit it, but maybe they're trying to capitalise it on it a little bit too much. I think if you want to share your coming out story, share your coming out story. You shouldn't be thinking of how is this going to grow my channel. You should be thinking of how can this help people. Callum seems dedicated to his audience. YouTube has given him a platform to talk about the things he is passionate about. And ultimately, that seems more important to him than any view count. However, he did raise some interesting points, which I think need to be explored further. I'm on my way to talk to 1080, an online magazine focused on YouTube culture. As professional journalists working outside of the community, I hope they can offer a critical perspective on YouTubers using sexuality to gain views and popularity. So 1080 is always on top of what's current on YouTube. What kind of thing seems to be popular with content at the moment? I'd say that at the moment, one of the biggest trends that we're probably seeing is not necessarily like a meme or anything like that. It's more the idea of people championing who they are and their beliefs and that kind of thing. So I think we're seeing a lot of sort of YouTubers who are coming out now as sort of ambassadors for, you know, of being who they are and being and sort of promoting that. So championing people's identities, I assume sexuality comes under that? Yes, very much so. I mean, down on a YouTuber level, I actually think uh, queer YouTubers are, have probably been <laughs> trendsetters. If you're saying the trend is people are being more open about it, I think like LGBTQ YouTubers have been talking more openly for a longer time. So when we look at people who've really grown in the last few years, Dodie Clark, for example, what kind of factors have contributed to that? The, the massive big boom is because she's being managed really well, she's had a couple of brand deals and she's got this new EP out. She's, it's all building and picking up pace from there. But the, the continual thread is how genuine and down to earth and open she is. So does that mean that her sexuality feeds into that kind of openness? Yeah, and I mean, a lot, some of her videos where she has talked about her sexuality, I suppose you can follow her on her journey because some of her earlier videos, she's less okay using the label of bisexuality, but then you can sort of follow through how later on she's changed her mind. And that seems, you know, very human, like it's the natural progression of understanding yourself, but she's being open about that online. And so it takes audiences along with her on that journey. But because Dodie doesn't talk about sexuality so much on her channel, do you think some people see it as her trying to use it for views or kind of bring it out occasionally and not engage with it? Even by suggesting that, with the example of Dodie, that she's saying that she's bisexual for attention, it's kind of like it's proving the point for why we need more voices talking <laughs> about being bisexual because she isn't. She's just sharing one part of her life when she feels the time is right, when she's comfortable. Um, and ultimately, that that video is going to help someone in our audience so that there's more of a positive impact uh, on the wider community. What do you think about the idea that some YouTubers might utilise their sexuality online in order to gain popularity? I think that probably does happen but not as intentionally as some people seem to think. I don't think people are going out, oh I'm gay, I'm gonna keep my coming out video on the low down and utilise it in the right moment to maximise the possibilities. You have to be aware that some things are going to be a bit more profitable, but ultimately I don't think the motivations behind doing, the, doing this sort of stuff is to make money or to get views. I think it is more, how many people is this going to help? So it kind of talks about how gay YouTubers aren't really doing this purely for views, but what about straight YouTubers who might participate in queerbaiting? I think queerbaiting is, yeah, when you look at straight YouTubers that are Put in creating thumbnails of them, a straight YouTuber with another straight YouTuber collaborating and making it seem like something is happening or that, you know, particularly when people are being shipped together, it's, yeah, I think when you look at LGBT YouTubers, no, because there's so much more behind that. But when you're looking at queer baiting and straight YouTubers, yes, that's ultimately just so that they're going to click on the video. So would you say that YouTube is making this content, it's doing it more for the audience than for the YouTuber themselves? 
I'd say it's a balance, pretty much, yeah. I think when YouTubers are looking at what topics they're going to be talking about, they want to talk about things that they know are going to make an impact for good or, you know, just for education. So I think there is an element of that. But at the same time, I do think that YouTubers are going on these journeys themselves. So I think they're, through doing that, they're also learning more and, you know, finding out more whether they're researching the videos or um, what they're going to talk about or whether it's more of a vloggy format, you know, we're seeing their life and them grow as a person. But I think ultimately that's for the good of their audience. The idea of straight YouTubers exploiting sexuality isn't a topic that has previously come up, but the intentions are clearly to get people clicking. YouTubers discussing their own sexuality, whether or not these intentions are there, can ultimately provide good for the community. Today I'm heading back to the YouTube space London for an LGBT meetup, but I've got time for one more quick chat. I've managed to grab a few minutes with LA-based YouTuber Sarah. I'm hoping to talk to her about some of the similarities and perhaps the differences between the US and the UK YouTube community. going? Good, how are you doing? Um, brilliant. I kind of just wanted to ask you a few questions about, um, we've heard from some people from the UK and I wanted to hear some stuff from the US um, about the kind of online LGBT community and beyond. Um, so I suppose the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was how is it different from say London, the LA based LGBT community? What's it like over there? I mean, the LGBT community, especially in major cities like uh, LA and New York, I've lived in both is uh it's very tight-knit <laughs> um you know you kind of know everyone in the scene in both uh definitely more in la than in new york um but it's it's a supportive it's like a chosen family really it's like a very supportive cool community in terms of the um like LG lgbt youtube in the ux do you feel like it has a particular purpose to it i think that everywhere there's a purpose for it there's we it's for visibility. We need, we're underrepresented as a community in traditional media. Um, so I think regardless of where you are, it's important to, like all YouTubers have this sidebar mission of creating content for our community. So I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts about the different reasons or the different reasons it's perceived that people talk about their sexuality online. The idea that people might exploit their sexuality for views on YouTube. I think there absolutely have to be, in every situation, people doing things for the right reason and people doing things for the wrong reason. Um, it would be idealistic of me to say that no one is doing it for the views, um, but there is a significant amount of people in the community that are doing it for what I consider the right reasons, and maybe I'm not the perfect judge of that, but um, you know, people who are doing it for visibility and to reach an audience who is underserved. So thinking about your own community, have you managed to foster that kind of positive environment with your fans? Yeah, I, um, I feel like I've gotten insanely lucky with my fans, to be honest. I have a very awesome and positive comment section, and I, I feel like that's very rare and very lucky. Have you had those same kind of positive experiences, sort of in real life, as it were, at, at fan events or things like that? Um, yeah, I feel like... A lot of times, this is strange because it's happening more and more lately, is I'll get messages from fans that are like, I saw you in public, but I was too afraid to come up to you. And I don't think that I like present myself as like this like scary person, but I maybe come off that way. I I'm not sure. Um, so that's happening a lot lately. And I don't want it to. I always message back and I'm like, you should have said hi. Like, I'll be so happy to see you and meet you. So you definitely you know, if you're out and about, want to be having these conversations with your viewers, is that something that you're, you know, you want to connect with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, proponent for the idea of making the most of every single moment. So if I saw, you know, someone I was a fan of, I would, not only would I say hi to them because that would make me happy, I would also try to do my best to, like, engage them in a conversation that I you know, want to know these are people that I look up to. Um, and they, though they talk to me every week on the internet, there's something else about being in person where you have that ability to actually get to know them on a deeper level. Even from that quick chat, I think it's clear to me that there isn't actually that much of a difference between how the US and the UK LGBT YouTube community values the impact that they have on their viewers. 
but I think it's time that we talk to those viewers themselves to get a sense of the whole picture. So I'm currently on my way to the London YouTube space where we're going to be having our LGBT creator meetup. So I'm kind of looking to find out today is how the viewers think about this. We've talked a lot to creators and I've kind of had some thoughts and made some opinions about why they're doing it in relation to their viewers, but I want to see what the viewers think about all this. We've set up a vlogging area to give the viewers a chance to share their thoughts. I'd like to know why YouTube is the place to be to discuss sexuality. I feel like in real life, there's not enough representation or people that you can gain advice from or people that you can just speak to in like a comfortable, safe environment. So I definitely think a lot of people turn to YouTube because there is that sense of community. So when I reached out onto YouTube, I realized I was actually a normal person that really boosted my confidence. I really felt like I was accepted in society, which is a really nice feeling, actually. And how about the event tonight? What does that say about the community? It I... says that we make friends quickly. Yes, definitely. <laughs> we didn't like know each other before no. this. We met in the queue. Yeah, we were <laughs> talking about rain. Just coming to this event, it's so nice to see such a wide variety of like different people. And it is just so friendly. Like You can just talk to anyone and oh, everyone's just kind of like, yeah. And I like I've met quite a few people today who've like watched like me and stuff and it's just so nice to put faces to viewers and things and it's it's nice to know that they feel comfortable to talk to you. I feel like a, the LGBT plus community is incredibly tight knit, especially here in London because it's like you're kind of like living in a bubble. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to reach out of that, but it's also nice to accept the community that you have and feel that you're in a space that is safe. Being online just opens up a whole world of people who are similar to you and that kind of shows how there are more people out there who are like you than you think and that you should never feel like you're alone. Finally at the end of this journey it's time for me to come back in front of the camera and to talk about what we've learned talking to different YouTubers about their relationship with their sexuality in their videos, we've seen the importance of things like titles, thumbnails, or when to release a video. But I think that it's less that they're doing it for the views, and more that they're doing it for the viewers. Talking to viewers tonight, it's clear this isn't a one-way relationship. These creators help educate them about their sexuality, gain confidence, and ultimately, feel less alone.